Hello, welcome to Zombie Studio in Manchester for a computer music exclusive special. Uh, my name is Mr. Scruff. This is my glamorous assistant, Mr. Andy Kings. Hi. Multi talented uh, and a very clever chap to make up for my complete lack of ability in the studio. Um, <laughs> it's half ten in the morning now, and by dinner time, we're going to try and have a track. Um, at least half done from scratch, so we're going to have some fun now, we're going to get the mics up, loads of instruments, we've got a big box of percussion in it, we've also got a box of soldering irons and gaffer tape, which I'm sure will make some interesting noises. <laughs> so we're going to switch on all the kit, set some mics up, get the kettle on and get cracking. So I think first of all we're just going to get some um, random banging down and give ourselves something to start with. We're going to use the Avalon for the bass drum. Uh, it's, it's not a very clean sounding preamp. It, it's a valve preamp, but it's, it's very clean. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to sort of model the sound or change the sound afterwards using plugins. Yes. Here, it, we're still on Logic 7 here. Yes. We're now there's a reason for that. That's because when we started the album, or when Andy started his album, four Four, three years ago. Three years ago. Three years yeah. ago, it was um, it was well, it was what we were using. So most of the sessions have been done in Logic Session. So for continuity, just to get the album finished, we've stayed with Logic Seven. Although I do have Logic Eight as well. Um, this mm. it was really was just the easiest option. Right, this is a Brauner. Uh, you might have seen them advertised. Uh, this was yes. A, this is quite a high end mic. It's sort of uh, like a an alternative to a Neumann uh, 87, something like that. Uh, it's, it's a valve, it's a, it's a valve, uh, sorry, no, it's not a valve, it's a transistor mic, but we're going to put it through a valve preamp and then hopefully overdrive the preamp to just get it sounding ni nice and grungy. Which is kind of ironic in a way, seeing us spent all, you know, all the money on a microphone that sounds so warm and, and clear and crisp, and then we're going to try and make it sound like a an SM58, hopefully. You don't need any headphones for this, do you? If you set that up. We'll do the tempo after this. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's great. It's a grungy sound. I didn't think I thought that that was a... Right, so what we need to do now really is find the tempo, or the, the approximate tempo, because you don't mind it sounding a little lumpy. Yeah, well, well, it was about 95, that, but we'll get a two bar loop in. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so the, the, the trick in doing this, let me just pull up the. Uh, hmm, pull up the transport. At the moment, set to 120. We'll get it approximately right. We're going to the audio. Editor. We're working on Logic, it seems to work best for these. I think Logic's a great writing tool actually. Right, so as you see, I'm just going to try and make a two bar loop. Which is, that's, that's, that's pretty good. But the trick here, there's, a, there's actually a little, um, well, it's not a trick, it's a shortcut available. I can actually assign the tempo um, to fit within the uh, block that I've just created. And what I'll do is I'll click on functions and then scroll down. Logic 7, it's in Logic 8 as well, um, but it's adjust tempo by selection and locators. And as you can see, it's a two bar loop. So I've set a two bar loop up on the arrange page. When I click this, I want to do it globally because I want to do it over the whole track. I don't want to make a, a tempo change. And there you go, the whole thing now uh, should be perfectly in time and we can have a look what the tempo actually is. Uh, 86.2493 so that's precisely. what it's calculated precisely. Let me just the transport so perfect. So now we can hopefully most of it should be approximately in time. Like that. So I've just used the Alt and the arrow as the shortcut in Logic 7. Um, and I can move by nudges, either way, left or right. And then I'll use the scissor tool just to lean it all up. Be very neat and put a little fade on the beginning. Fadey, fadey. Can 
Control and T will stretch any block of audio to fit into the loop that you've set up at the top of the page. So here it's actually processing on my old trusty steam powered G5 quite slowly. I'm just, I'm just setting up a mix now so that we can Andrew can hear his bass drum because he'll, he'll need to hear that. Make sure I'm not... And we use um, Apogee converters. Um, we've had Motu ones as well in the past, but this was kind of a step up at a point when um, as uh, we built sort of a, a mast, a rig of kind of quite nice outboard gear. It seemed a shame to put it through what essentially might not have been as good a quality preamp as uh, sorry um, digital converter as the gear we were using. So we stepped it up. Um, it's great. Yes, exactly. I've caught that at the beginning, so I'll turn the preamp down. Uh, but let's have a just have a quick listen over the sound, and then we can EQ it. This is it's not the ideal way of doing things, but it's the way that works. Sounds alright. So what we can do here, obviously, if I work on the uh, EQ quickly. I just that actually sounds pretty good. Mm. Uh, it does actually. Mm. But we can actually, if that. Right, so quite, quite often um, when we're uh, EQing something, especially even in the bass end, we'll probably put um, a filter on right at the bottom end just to get rid of really, really low stuff that just takes energy and doesn't actually use, isn't audible. So I've got a, a low cut there at, at 30 hertz. And then I put a little bump above that just to get, um, and we can we can move that up and down. Now, the, hitting it with a beater, it had a real um, sort of clicky noise. And it's very loud. We have a real sharp attack on it. And when I was kicking it. It's much quieter, but because there's less attack, when you turn the sound up, there's a lot more bottom end and, and kind of sub uh, to the kick drum. So out of that quite wonky out of time take, we've got a quite wobbly two bar loop, but it's quite nice when it sort of pushes and pulls a bit. You don't need to quantize everything. No. So for now we're going to choose the duller uh, kicking kick drum. So we're going to hide that track just to avoid temptation of messing with it unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, just going to stick to a 4-4 four four for the moment. Now I quite fancy this stapler as a snare. In order to get a nice kind of ring off it, we're going to go out into the corridor, which has got a really nice kind of two second reverb. We're in a very old building with a very nice sounding corridor outside, so we're going to go and get, bring out the ring in that. Um, and just try recording from a few different positions as well. Try recording right close to the mic, and then I'll go upstairs a level, and you'll get more of the reverb just by itself. Uh, so very quickly you can make decisions on um, your recording basically with effects and, and then and it's all down to how you mic it and, and where the mic positioning is and where the instrument's positioned or the stapler's positioned. We're just setting a level. Uh, she switched the light off. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, there's kind of people around there. 
quite a nice sound. Okay, right, so we've got a little electrical buzz in the background, but we're gonna, we're gonna go with that. So that's some close ones, we're gonna move away a little bit more. This is quite noisy. So that's enough for that little splashy splash. So we're going to go back in the studio and just see whether that was a really good idea or a really rubbish one. Okay, so let's have a listen to the work in the stairwell. We're going to listen to the stapler first, see how that sounds. Ooh, that sounds nice. Uh, it might be that because it's quite a big splashy sound, we might just have it maybe on the four or something like that. It's quite a bold piece of punctuation, so you don't want to completely smother the track in, in stapler noises. So Andrew's currently trimming up these lovely uh, staplers. Probably, Is um, the one with a gap after it, like more than a more than a beat length. You see what I mean? They should be or two beats. Of those, um, let me just swap that in one off. This, not really. No, that's fine. That's that's cool. But that's just not. thinking every fourth and I'll just roll them Yeah, up. something like that. Look. Right, next, symbols. Yeah, so... Which yeah, so we'll listen to that symbol recording, see if any of it sounded any good. I quite like those. Those, weren't they? Yeah, those, yeah. yeah, those ones. So those, those were all... Yeah, so let's just go for those that suck off the rest. I mean, luckily we're trying to create quite a relaxed wonky, almost drunk groove. Good job, really, because I'm rubbish at playing instruments, but I can kind of bang stuff roughly in time. Ah! Let's get that kind of a bit closer, yeah? So we've got some loops. Now, most of the loops we've taken so far of the drums, we've got a, a two-bar shaker loop, which has been not messed with. We've got a two bar bass drum loop which is quite wonky and hasn't been messed with. Um, now these cymbals is a particularly out of time bit at the end uh, which I quite like. It's almost like got a little triplet shuffle to it um, but it's definitely over the limit if it was caught by the, uh, the percussion police. Quite like that, and let's have a listen to the other bits. That's quite nice as well. It seems a little bit to be rushing a little bit to me, so I'm just going to use Alt and the arrow uh, just to knock it a little bit later. I'm just going to have a play around with um, various lengths, see whether I want to use a whole two bar loop or just a little two beat loop or a one bar loop or something like that. So there's two quite cheeky loops there. Now I heard Andy banging on uh, something around the corner and I'm thinking that sounds, uh, that sounds like could be our next. Oh, yes, so our next subject for recording. So we've got all those bits and bobs in. We may or may not use all of them, but I don't want to dwell on it um, too much. And we don't want 50 layers of stuff. It's less is more quite often, in, uh, especially if you want to keep quite a loose feel. The more stuff you have in, it just ends up sounding like a mess. 
Uh, so we're going to have some congas. Actually, play by a trained musician this time. I wouldn't subject you to my attempts at conga playing. Right, I reckon a 57 on these. Well, I've just been setting the congas up, been messing around with these uh, cymbals. And because the shake, the shake is quite linear and everything's quite repetitive, um, I thought, oh, it's good to start adding some elements where there's, there's a gap. Just has a bit of a push and pull in the track as well. So we've got the stapler, which is only on the four, and then we've got the cymbal. It just comes in on like a two hand and comes out on the one hand. So you've got sort of two beats on, two beats off. So we're already getting a bit of a seesaw thing. Just using a fifty-seven. But what I've actually done is I've gone. I've used the preamp in the Avalon. And then I'm using the auxiliary. Can we have a listen to how that sounds just over the speakers? Yeah. Um... So you get a bit of feedback, but if you come up to the speakers, you can kind of hear that it's quite a nasty, distorted sound. So quite, quite distorted. Obviously, we won't have the feedback on there, but it's. It just gives it a really kind of musical ring to it. Given it, it's almost given it the um, the tones for a, a bass or something like that. It's actually in dun dun dun, which is bits, which put it into almost suggesting some sort of a key. Mm. Even if it is slightly out of tune, we don't mind slightly out of tune. No, out of tune is good. So I've had one listen through. There's a few bits that have stuck out. Uh, there's some bits around bar nine, around bar thirteen. I just chopped out. That drunk bit before, there's one uh, impressively drunk well. bit fell over. Yeah. <laughs> Because we've got a two bar loop, and that's a one bar loop of conga, I just want to check that the feel of the playing works over both bars. Um, and just out of curiosity, I also want to try this pattern, um, push it two bars earlier because just because of the, the whole emphasis of, of the stapler, of, of that snares on the four. Um, and quite often when I was listening to the conga pattern I was hearing the three being the one. So um, we'll have a listen to that. when you're recording um, quite quick takes of, of, you know, even if it's quite simple patterns, you'll end up finding four or five bits that you like and you have to make a decision quite early on. Now this is where I've normally spent about two days going, hmm, so obviously on camera I'm going to try and uh, get my arse in gear and make a couple of choices. I might choose two conga patterns, check they work together and get rid of the rest just to, um, just to cut down the number of choices and, and um, the kind of time it takes to actually finish a tune just because you, you end up giving yourself so many options that you know you, you just end up going around in circles. Now listening back to where we did that other conga bit before, I think that's really nice, simple, strong thing. And I, I also think now we've moved it half a bar back, it's, it's um, given a little bit of ambiguity as to where the one and the three is, which is quite nice to have, a, have a, um, something 
that engages you musically where you, you're you not quite sure where your reference point is in the track. Um, so let's just use that one bit. And we can just run this all the way through. First I'm just going to tidy it up. So this is our final selection of the conga bit. Now to make sure it loops all right, um, I'm just going to loop one bar of it, but just focus on the join. I know this this point and this point is is, is are going to loop okay because that's actually part of the same um, waveform. Special track for him now. Yeah, we're just, we're just knocking it up. So, I was saying before, it generally takes me a very long time to finish anything, so it's actually good to be under the clock. How long have you got? Like an hour and a half or um, something? Yeah, about another hour and ten minutes. As you can see, the speed we're working at, we're not doing levels as well yeah. as we could. Yeah, but that's all, it's all good. So basically, we've got this is the audio of the uh, the Hammond. Now, Andy generally when Andy does something, I go, "Oh, that's good. Let's record it." We just go, "Oh, just play," doo -doo -doo, and we kind of have a pretty good idea of what's going to be recorded anyway, rather than ten minutes of of all that and then spending like four days sifting through it. So we just get sixteen bars of pretty much the same thing played over. Um, we have this, that sound, and then... Oops. A much harsher sound. I think this the, the first sound suits the track a bit better, so we're just going to get rid of that. Okay. So I'm just going to move that note a little bit later. Um, <laughs> Now, obviously, with us recording the Hammond with the lovely reverb, if we leave any gaps, it's, it's going to be very, very obvious. Um, I just cycle it around that bit and illustrate it. Um, so I've moved that from there back there. It still needs to be a little bit later. Now, what I'm going to do just to make it sound a bit more natural is just take the reverb from that second note and hopefully that should sound uh, pretty natural Something I've been wanting to do for a while is um, just record the strings on the piano. Now you hear there's some quite a lot of say David Axelrod recordings or yeah. sort of late 60s, early 70s soundtracks, quite spooky, moody music. <laughs> probably a lot of Wu Tang as well. That kind of you know probably used a lot for um, sort of music concrete in horror films and. Uh, kung fu movies and anything where you, you just need a quite an odd alien sound, and especially before synths became readily available, um, making unusual sounds out of basically 
um, preparing instruments, the prepared piano and stuff like that. This was quite common if you were like a, a bit of a studio whiz in the, in the 50s or the 60s. Then you were basically taping things to the piano and or a guitar or anything like that, any traditional instruments and trying to make them sound uh, completely unlike what they're supposed to sound like. Um, now I really like the very sparkly top end in these pianos and because we don't really have any real high frequencies um, it'd be nice to introduce a little bit of, uh, of, of an element in that, in that area of the, of the spectrum. So there's quite a lot of low rumble and background noise there, which That's all right. I would be more likely to get rid of, but Andrew... No, I think we should leave it today. So he will keep that. Yeah. But I may just get rid of some of the really low rumble. But we did actually have a high pass filter on just in case, but I might just get rid of a little bit more. <laughs> Also, it reminds me of Backpuss. Go on, Backpuss. There we go. I think in a tune like this, there's quite a lot of cheeky elements going on, but it's got a it's got a bit of no nonsense bottom end, which pretty much goes for all my tunes really. But it's got to be kind of friendly, but so you wouldn't mess with it. So we're just building up its bulk at the moment, adding some muscle. I'm tired of that bandpass on that. Yeah. I'm tired yeah, I love it. Love it. Love it. Love this bandpass. <laughs> section. Um, you've got to be careful when you've got loads of really nice noises just not to overdo it and fill every gap with stuff. Um, so we're just going to have those crazy things just every two bars. <laughs> some Juno before um, and we're kind of getting a bit of, we've got a bit of an electric piano sound but quite sort of electric piano synth style sound and then just a little wibble and it sounded okay before but then I patched it through the, um, through the reverb. Quite, quite nice and spooky. Well, I'll, I'll do it. 
and it's, it's got um, the, um, it just yeah. the spring well, gives it a very um, very different sound. Obviously, it sounds like it's yeah. from somewhere back in time now. Well, the editing, all I've done is I had a tape which basically was yeah. these three tracks here. Uh, we just had it looping round. So we had a take of about 48 bars or something like that, where me and Andy were just doodling on the keyboard. And then you just listen through. Um, prior to listening to it, Andy had patched in the, uh, the reverb, so basically we were just listening to it with the effect that it's going to have on it. And, um, yeah, you just wait till something pokes out and go, yeah, that actually looks re works really nice, it adds to the mood of the piece. Um, so yeah, another little bit of call and answer going on over a four bar thing. Every two bars we've got a little wham wham. Yeah. That bit, and then there's just this bit. Uh, we're just going to record that big uh, spring wind tune, yeah. I think. Get some nice uh, stereo in. We put three and four. Yeah. Oh yeah. We're just going to record a bit of the noise as well, so that when we drop the reverb in and out, the noise doesn't become noticeable by just jumping in or cutting out. And when we recorded the Juno spring reverb in, which I've now just put under the Juno channel, um, actually goes a colour. Nice. When we recorded it, we bounced the spring out, um, sent it out of an auxiliary and recorded it back in in stereo. But we also recorded a bit after it stopped, so we just get the tail of the reverb. Um, so you can loop it here and repeat it twice, so that'll loop OK. And then you make sure you record it before the sound comes in and also after it finishes, so you've got the beginning, a middle and an end. Um, just so you don't have any abrupt stops when um, you've got to cut out the reverb before the next sound comes in. So you just let the reverb tail off into silence or into, into, into that hiss. Phenomenal amount of hiss. Yeah, phen phen phenomenal amount of hiss. Try a bit of that on the clav or something on the clav because I think that sounds. You've, only, you've got about 10 minutes to mix it now. Yeah. It's mixed. Yeah. Well, you just send it to bus one, yeah? The clav to bus one? Yeah, oh, no, not all of it, just um, like set send up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. That's number nine. Yeah, and that, that'll be sending it to there. Totally. Off there. That's quite nice. Roll it right off. Quite spacey. So there we go, that's the clav reverb in. Well, we don't want the clav reverb to be as, um, as as present as the Juno reverb, so we'll just have it quite subtle just to give a bit of, uh, sort of body and warmth. And we've got a few like proper old school reverbs, so we tend to end up recording reverb in rather than using plugins. Like got, got 480, got that funky old spring. So we've got quite a lot of the elements in there, it's enough to be getting on with. Um, and it's all working together, there's a, there's a good you know, a good selection of sounds and riffs and things like that. Um, so we're going to start, just do a very quick rough arrangement now and just get some levels up. I mean, we're already running three minutes over, so um, although this has been a very quick session we normally take a lot longer on it so we just uh, get something very brief up and obviously have to finish it properly at a later date but this is the the most interesting and active and most interesting to watch um, part of the tune making anyway the next you know the next few hours of just being kind of and you know just lots of very fine tweaking and doing stuff and then realising that it sounded better before Lots of turning it. things up by 2 dB and then turning them back down 2 dB about an hour later. Yep, then exactly, turning yeah. them back up 2 dB again. Then turning them back down again. Yep, Once so. you've done that a few times, it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> three years, yeah. yeah. Possibly for a year or so. <laughs> then he's kind of OK. Will you live with it for a bit? When I used to work with him in the past, before you could save everything in the computer and it was all the same, we worked a lot quicker. Because once you've taken a mix down on the mixing desk, it's kind of game over. Because right? you can save all this stuff, you can always, always carry on fiddling. Right, well, I'm just getting some levels 
the, the bass drum, because we had quite a, a woolly bass drum before, and we're putting a lot of um, a lot of noise over the top of it. It's not cutting through quite as much as you know as, as it wouldn't do not having a lot of attack. So that's a kick drum by itself. So I think what I'm going to do is just use the same kick drum and kind of get them lined up. You've got to be careful doing this because you can get phasing when you've got two signals that sound pretty similar yeah, right. laid up. So you have to lay them very, very carefully because they can cancel each other out. Yeah, so I'll do, I'll do it very quickly, uh, visually, just to check. Now see these kick drums are really all over the place. That one's very early. It's obviously in a rush to get somewhere. This is a two bar loop and we're, we're laying up, layering up uh, the bass drums on the one and the three on each bar. So I've, I've done four kick drums now. So just get this right and if it works then uh, we can just copy it across. That sounds alright. You do that a lot don't you layering up bass drums? Like, yeah I do a lot. If you've got a sound yeah. you like and then you haven't got enough attack in it, it's just add something else and it's got a little bit of bite or something. See, sometimes it's easier than EQ because if, if, if the frequency is not there then there's no point trying to turn up. If you're trying to make a bass drum click by turning up 2k or something like that but there's no frequency there then it, it just won't work. So just take a kick drum that's got a lot of 2k and just fade that in with it and just use that, the, the, the attributes of different sounds. <laughs> So just setting the level of the, uh, the bass drum that we're getting the click off. Now if we have it up too loud, it becomes very apparent how out of time my playing is. So we're just going to have that just very quietly adding a bit of extra punctuation. It's kind, of, it's kind of juxtaposing the congas as well now, isn't it? It's, sort of, it's got that sort of push and pull again. Yeah. Now I'm just going to balance the, uh, the drums and the percussion with the bass and make sure that the, the relationship between the bass and the kick drum, um, uh, just make sure the bass isn't covering up the kick drum. Just by listening and, and checking that the kick drum is punchy enough, but the bass is weighty enough, but one, you know, the, the kind of both doing different jobs. You, you might even hack a little bit of the frequency out of the bass drum or something to let the bass through. So if, if there's a lot of 60 hertz going on in, in your bass or something, or there's a lot of real sub, then maybe just take a little bit of the sub from, from the bass drum because you don't want them both fighting for the same same space. So it's just, it's just about making the layers all fit together. You imagine the, the layers of frequency don't argue with each other. Once I've got the uh, the bass in, the original move bass, which is quite percussive and almost like a bass drum, um, I'm going to balance the Roland uh, bass yeah, along this. Now if I'd been doing this properly I would have separated well, the bass and the drums and all the synths and the different instruments into buses just to make all this a little bit quicker, but I've not even put EQ on yet and I'm... Um, I quite like that. I'm quite happy quite just to like balance it how it is like because all everything sounds pretty good and there's you know enough enough different noises well, it is to kind of kit like for normal and all that rather than they, they, they kind of separate themselves quite well as long as long as you don't uh, ram a track full of too many elements all on top of each other you can get away without using EQ which is what I'm going to try and do today apart from just getting rid of really low rumble say if I was recording some hi hats I might just put a high pass filter on just to make sure nothing below 100 hertz gets gets through then you're leaving more space for the bass but generally um, there's no real corrective EQ needed it's all been recorded how we want it by you know clever people with good quality mics so it's uh, yeah. you know, the less EQ in the better. Can we get some spring on just that uh, rolling bit there? <laughs> Recording more spring reverb on that because there's not enough hiss in the track yet. Yeah, yeah, to exactly. layer up some more layers of hiss. Worried, right? I'm just going to 
to change the EQ slightly on each one. So even though the synth is, is the same thing repeated, because we're going to mix the reverb in quite heavily, it'll kind of make it sound like it's being filtered a bit. Good. You have to use a rapid 53 work line or you don't get a very good sound otherwise, yeah. Don't tell her what it is. Yeah. Right, I'm going to go and bully me teenagers again. Okay, you going to set the staple No. Well, that would be really cruel. I could just staple the f***ers. Goodbye. So we're going to start a bit of an arrangement now. So we're just going to start off with the percussion of the, uh, the shaker and the stapler, the cymbal and the conga loop. going to try a few um, elements to see what sounds good coming in first. Now to me that little Roland uh, bit that we sent through the spring reverb would probably sound better um, coming in a little bit later. <laughs> Just trying to bring in maybe a new element every four bars or so. So we're up to bar 21, we've got the Hammond and the Clav which work well together. Um, there's a few elements I've not brought in yet. We've got the piano and the sort of percussive mood bass line, so there's a few more bits to play with. I think with this track it's quite linear, we've not really done, it's just like one section, it's all in one key. Um, or one key. And, um, so it's just getting everything to bubble along nicely and not try and do too much of it. It's just about the kind of, you know, some daft noises and being quite cheery and a bit wonky and bouncy with a lot of bass in it. So I'm kind of mixing as I go as well. Um, as every element comes in, you can kind of tell whether it's the right volume or not. Um, because the clav and the Hammond are kind of working together, I pan the Hammond very slightly. Uh, right and um, the clavs a bit left just they're kind of chirping along and talking to each other having a nice little conversation about who's making the next brew or whatever <laughs> Even though I set the mood bass volume before when I was just listening to the beat and turned it down quite a lot now we've added that extra bass drum, um, I've turned that back up. I think because it's quite a subby sound as well, um, it takes up a lot more energy than, than say, the, um, the bass noises from the other synth, which have a lot more uh, mid frequencies in them. So I'm going to notch that bass back up about another 4 dB, just so it's uh, audible and um, yeah, creates an impact when it comes in. <laughs> I think by that point we've had far too much hammering, so we're going to take that out. Because we've kind of been gradually adding, adding elements, some of which are, are quite riffy or, or percussive, and others that are more general atmospheric bits. By the time that's all bubbling along there, you can't quite pick out every sound. So sometimes when that happens, when you're subtly introducing new elements, Stuff can be already happening, and then you'll take something else out, and you'll and you'll notice something uh, that's already been in for a minute. It's just been bubbling along there quietly, and suddenly it pokes its head out and goes, "Hello." So we've dropped the beat out there, um, and then at this point, I'm going to take out some of the more musical elements like the the Hammond, and that will throw focus on more well, the bottom end stuff, the percussion, and some of the sort of spacey, freaky noises like the piano that we've been leaving in. We've had a bit 
too much of that bass in there as well, the kind of wah, wah, that bass, so we'll take that out and just let it kind of, sort of percolate along doing its little uh, ripply goodness. <laughs> Symbols out on this bit as well. And what I might do, just to make it sound even spacier, is leave the uh, the spring reverb that we've put on the Juno, but take out the dry signal. So we've just got the really ghostly um, sort of reflections of the sound. So basically we're taking a lot of the mid-range out and, and this, this section will be focusing on just kind of percussion and bottom end stuff and, and texture and, uh, and that kind of thing. <laughs> bits of tidy up, tidying up that I've neglected. Um, here the Roland bass bit kind of doubles up slightly so I'm just going to make sure that because we were kind of messing around with the EQ on the spring reverb live before um, we're just keeping some of that more interesting kind of stereo stuff we're doing for in the breakdown when you'll really hear it. <laughs> It's a very simple little tune. I'm um, just going to have a quick go through and make a few holes in the arrangement and give things space to breathe. I just had a little bit of presence um, and kind of tape style compression to the bass drum. Not very much, it's a nice sounding bass drum anyway, just to make it a bit tougher and, uh, and huger. So I'm just trying a few mutes and stuff on the fly, and if it works, I just kind of program that in. And it was a bit lumpy, so I'm just going to not be too accurate with the editing. Because sometimes when you punch stuff in and out live on a desk, it has a little bit of a, you know, you can't be perfectly on the beat all the time. And sometimes that gives it a bit of a sort of raggedy energy, which stops the track sounding too kind of neat and polished. Just trying to get the end tidied up now. I don't mind a bit of ambience on the end. Um, but it's good just to have maybe uh, some of the reverb tails just vanishing off into the distance. So we had a few, uh, I remember from the conga session before, we had a few sort of daft, daft noises at the end. fiddle around with this, Andrew has uh, routed the whole mix out to this uh, mix compressor which is a... Uh, Al Smart. Al Smart Research C2 mix compressor. It's, it used to work at SSL and this is basically what they used to call the, 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 the posh button at the end of an SSL desk. It's like a bus compressor um, that they used to use, I think it was on the G series desk. So at the end of the mix is, he said, can, can you press the pop button, which is basically this, and it knits the whole thing together. We'll be able to A, B it in a minute, just by mm. keying it in and out, and then you'll get a, a, 
the impression of exactly what he's doing. Get input one and two up on here. Right, the output one and two. Should yeah, I'll say. put one and two. Let's just see at what level we're getting. See if we can just boost it a bit. Ah, oh, that's why. Master volume's all the way down. Right, Ooh. turn the threshold. Let's try and get a bit more attack on it, and I'll push that bass drum. You know, just for really, just, just, just for now, really quickly, I think it's half a sheet, but I just want to put a little bit of rope there. Yeah, because we've not had time... We've not had time to do a full balance. We've not put everything on the buses, and... Basically, as you start adding elements, especially as you start trying to maybe turn one thing up louder, like bass, so it competes with the drums, and you might go, oh, we're going to turn the bass drum up a bit, and you end up kind of slowly edging the volume up, and then you put all the buses on the group and pull them down, and when you pull one fader, it pulls all the faders down by the same amount, uh, and we've not done that, so um, rather than putting everything on the bus, which will take a few minutes, which we don't have at the moment, we're just going to put a, a limiter on, because we're only going like 5 dB over the top. Um, obviously if we were mixing the track down properly, we'd make sure everything was uh, peaking at below zero. Metering's really handy as well. These meters, um, uh, elemental audio. Uh, yeah, now these, these are really handy because you really need, metering's really important. I mean, I'm, I'm measuring the, the inputs now just to make sure that we're not going to peak. As you can see, we're not at the moment, but there's an alarm there, and if we peep, then that alarm will set, which means we're sending too much signal back into the computer. If you do that, it'll start to sound distorted, and you, you start to lose start to use clarity, lose clarity in your mix, which obviously is something you don't want to do. This also measures phase coherence. There, you've got the phase correlation meter, and also measures balance. You see, this is slightly to the left, so there's a bit more going on on the left, but that's okay because when the bass drum comes in. It kind of levels right out, that's kind of holding the whole mix together. But uh, on a longer mix, we'd make sure all this was absolutely really correct and all the sort of relationships between the pans were quite balanced. Right, now let's just have a listen. But when we turn this up a bit. Well, I mean, immediately, this is something that maybe uh, you're not going to pick up so well on the camera. It's adding presence, uh, a, lot more de a lot more detail at the top as well, so it's, and it's also knitting the parts together. And, we, and again, we spend more time messing around with settings on this as well. That's it's kind of like compressing by about 4 dB. 3, three to 4 dB, which is quite a lot, wouldn't usually be that much either. Bigger ratio as well, so that sounds, yeah. Faster I think, this, this is quite a sparse track. Um, I'm always interested to see how much you can push the compression in terms of being quite creative with it and just having fun and making it sound really a beast. this down now so we get a quick a finished two track version with the mix compression on. Um, I think if we'd had a bit more time uh, probably would have done a few more cheeky little edits just little drops and stuff like that 
Um, I quite like having some elements like the one bar on, one bar off, so you get a, even more of a kind of seesaw thing going on. So it's still repetition, but you're not, you've not got the same element constantly all the way through. I uh, probably would have paid a bit more attention to the bass drum, uh, maybe a bit of compression, a bit more sub. To be honest, maybe just turn the rest of the track down um, so the bass drum was a bit more, um, a, a bit more solid. Um, but to be honest, for a morning's work, that's you know, it's not too bad. Got a couple of yes. bruising as well, so everyone's happy. Nice. Should we, should we get it down? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Let's print it to tape. Print it to tape. Okay, here we go. Record. <laughs> So there we have it, three hours, a few cups of tea, lots of fun with microphones and instruments and banging stuff, uh, kicking things around the floor with myself, Uncle Philip, who's now gone to do some teaching, and uh, the number one musical handyman in the zombie studio, Mr Andy Kingslow. I think we've had, uh, yeah, had a really good, uh, good fun, and to be honest, it normally takes me about a week to get that far on a tune. Here's computer music!